My background in school was in intellectual history, what's sometimes called the history of ideas. And one of the basic premises is that if you want to understand a person's thought, you have to know when he or she lived, what the other people at the time were thinking. And the underlying premise there, of course, is that each person is a prisoner of his or her own time. It was a rare individual who could think outside the box. And usually the box would change just a little bit. And then the new box would be, become the prisoner for the people in the next generation. But somehow the practice of intellectual history itself seemed to be standing outside of time. In other words, it figured out all the other times, but somehow it wasn't subject to its own rules. When I met a John Fung, that got all overturned. I began to realize that I was a prisoner of my own time. It took a while, though. When I first went to Thailand and learned about Buddhism, people were saying the Buddha taught the truth about this, the truth about that. And my background kept telling me, well, he saw the truth through the lens of his own time. And he might have some useful insights for us now. But we'd have to bring him up to date. But as I said, meeting a John Fung turned that over. I saw now that I was a prisoner of my own time. And the Buddha was the one who had stepped out of time, after all, in his awakening. He did step outside of space and time. He saw that there was a happiness that existed outside of space and time, but it could be attained by the actions we do in space and time. That the event of his awakening was the primary event in world history. And the insights he gave are always valid. As he said at one point, what he gained in his awakening, the knowledge he gained in his awakening, was like the leaves in a forest. What he taught was a handful of leaves. And he taught that handful of leaves because it would have been of use to people to put an end to their own suffering. There's one passage where he talks about the many powers he gained through his awakening. But the three in particular that he kept repeating over and over again. One was knowledge of previous lifetimes, the other was knowledge of how beings are reborn after their death, in line with their karma. And the third was the knowledge of how to put an end to the effluence, in other words, these currents of defilement that come flowing out of the mind that lead to more becoming and more suffering. Those are the three that he found most useful to tell. And then, of course, after that he said he did get an awakening to nirvana, which was something deathless. Those are the premises we need. You might think of them as premises for action. This is why faith in the Buddha's awakening or conviction in the Buddha's awakening is so important. We don't like the word faith. It's become the F word in modern Buddhism. But there are certain things we have to believe if we want to find true happiness. One is that our course through life doesn't begin with this particular birth or end with the death of this body. It's going to be ongoing. And from the second principle, the second knowledge, we have the principle that how we are reborn is going to be determined by our actions which are intentions, which in turn are determined by our views. And our views, of course, are going to be determined by the extent to which we have respect for the Noble Ones, that we give them trust. Because their basic principle is that actions that are based on greed, aversion, and delusion 
are going to lead to suffering. Actions that are based on an absence of those things are going to lead in the direction of happiness. So we have to look at the intentions in our minds and the motivations for why we're acting. That's where we'll find what makes a difference between a course of action that leads to suffering and a course of action that leads away from suffering. And finally, the third knowledge. That if we focus on the problem of suffering and its cause, if we learn a path of action that can put an end to its cause, we will find true happiness. And a large part of that path of action is right view. And when the Buddha gave the most succinct statement of his awakening, it was the principle of causality. When this is, that is. From the rising of this comes the rising of that. When this isn't, that isn't. From the passing away of this comes the passing away of that. Two principles of causation, one in which causes and their effects arise at the same time and disappear at the same time, another in which you have causality over time. Something you do now will lead to a result later. The present moment is a combination of those two. And if you think about those principles, you realize that they open the way for freedom of choice. So if everything were determined by your past actions, you'd have no freedom. But there's something that the present moment that allows you to come up with something now that will have an effect now and on into the future. And because there's a pattern to what is skillful and unskillful. But there's room to adjust the forces of cause and effect. That provides the possibility for learning skills. After all, if there are no pattern, then what you learn today would not help you at all tomorrow. If the pattern were ironclad, in other words, totally predetermined, you'd have no choice. But here there's a pattern with a choice, which opens the possibility for developing the path to the end of suffering as a skill. It's something we can choose to do. So all these are basic premises that we need for having trust in the fact that our actions will make a difference and that we can learn skills that will give better and better results. This is what the Buddha brought back from stepping outside of time. And of course, the best results are precisely that, the ability to use human action to take you to a threshold beyond which you're outside of time. You can use actions within time to get out of time. And that's where the best happiness is, because any happiness that's in time is going to disappear as time changes. Where is the body that you were 20 years ago, 10 years ago? Where are your feelings? You may have memories of the past, but they're very much subject to change and can often be unreliable. You look within time, there's very little solidity, very little opportunity to settle in and say, okay, this is a good, safe place. So if you're really serious about happiness, the only happiness that's really going to be satisfactory is going to be the happiness that's outside of space and time. So these are the principles of the Buddha's premises, you might say, on the nature of action and the power of action. Now, he never said he could prove them to you, aside from getting you to follow his teachings. In the very beginning, he said, it's like a gamble, but it's a good bet. He listed a whole series of practices, he said, that you take them on. And if it turns out that he was wrong, at the very least, though, you've still led a blameless life, like developing the four Brahma Viharas. 
You develop goodwill for all. You can develop compassion for all, empathetic joy, equanimity, all around. Your actions are bound to be more skillful, less harmful. And if it turns out there is no rebirth, or actions don't have consequences, at the very least you can be honorable in your intentions. Same in believing the principle of the power of action, that you have choices. If you believe that you didn't have any choices, that would close off the doors to the possibility of any path of practice. If you accept as a working hypothesis that your actions will make a difference, okay, that opens possibilities. So you hear the Buddha saying, if you're going to gamble about what you're going to take on as your basic premises for your actions, it's good to gamble on the ones that open more possibilities, because you don't want to close things off simply because you don't know. So the possibility of stepping outside of becoming, putting an end to becoming, going beyond it, that's something that you take on as a working hypothesis. In other words, a deathless happiness is possible. That's a safer hypothesis than saying that it's not possible. If it's not possible, or if you believe it's not possible, then you're never going to do the actions that might possibly could take you there. Now, if it turns out that it's not true, still you've lived an honorable life. So even at the very beginning, it's a good bet. But it doesn't stay just a bet. Some people say, well, here the Buddha himself is saying he doesn't really know. He's not saying that. He's saying people who approach the path have to decide whether they're going to gamble on the path or not. Because action is a gamble. There's so much we don't know. But here the Buddha is offering a possibility. That your thoughts and your words and your deeds have this potential within in them to lead to something beyond them. And then you follow the path. And he said, at the point at which you step outside of time yourself, that's when you, you've guaranteed yourself or you've proven for yourself that what the Buddha said was true. And from that point on, you have what he calls verified confidence in his awakening. You have a witness, your own experience. And you realize that what he said about suffering coming from within was true. The nature of the Dharma I, whatever is subject to origination, is all subject to cessation. Now notice he's not saying everything that arises is going to cease or pass away. Subject to origination means caused. And when the Buddha uses the word origination, it's almost always in the context of things that are caused from within the mind. What's radical about the experience is that you begin to see that even your experience of the six senses is originated. In other words, there are conditions that flow from within that determine how you're going to see and hear and smell and taste and touch and think about things. And when those internal causes are ended, your connection with the world of the senses ends as well. At least it stops for the time being. That's what opens the possibility for an experience of the deathless. And it's from that experience that even that thought, all that is subject to origination, would occur. In other words, you're not just making a vague generalization. You've seen something that is not subject to origination is also not subject to cessation. And you realize that it's radically different from everything else you've ever experienced. And everything else you have experienced prior to that falls into whatever is subject to origination. But your verified confidence in the Buddha. You realize that your experience of time didn't start with the date of your birth. 
you see that for a long time before then. You may not have specific memories of previous lifetimes. But you get a new perspective on time by stepping out of it. And you realize that, yes, it is your actions that allow you to do this, the choices you've made. Which is why your virtues now become virtues pleasing to the noble ones. They're solid, they're sure, but at the same time you don't create a sense of pride around them. As the Buddha says, you don't make yourself out of the virtues. You use them as tools. And because there is an awareness that's there, even as the aggregates fall away, because the aggregates are, as the Buddha said, near and far, past, present, and future. In other words, they're in the coordinates of space and time. But there's still an awareness that remains even after those things fade away. You realize there's no reason why you'd ever want to identify with them or build an identity around them ever again. So it's in this way that you're freed in certain ways, even with just the first taste of the deathless. And what's especially good is you're freed of your doubt. You've seen for yourself that what the Buddha said is true, and that his awakening really was the main event in world history. And the knowledge that he shared based on his awakening is knowledge that's worth taking to heart, worth having faith in, so that you can act in ways that will test it. to see if you said was really true. If you're still at the very beginning where you don't know, at the very least you look at the path and you can see that it's a path that's honorable. You can hold yourself pure at least in terms of your intentions. And that's a lot to begin with right there. This is why the Buddha said the path is Admirable in the beginning, admirable in the middle, admirable in the end. It starts by your dedicating yourself to the purity of your intentions, and it leads to something that goes beyond intentions. It's something that's really worth experiencing for yourself. So faith in the Buddha, conviction in the Buddha's awakening, is a really good investment. It pays off in more ways than you can imagine.